So if you would, take your Bibles, because uh, while we have the logo up to the series that we've been in in the book of John, uh, truth is, this is going to be a sermon in which we look at a lot of different verses, because we're going to look, as John describes, the tree of life, and we're going to look primarily at first at John chapter 1, verses 1 through 5, and then 11 through 14. Uh, We touched on some of these verses last week, but we're going to add some things, uh, some additional verses from John chapter 1 in today's message. Then we're going to look at some other passages from Genesis to Revelation. Somebody said, are you going to preach the Bible today? Well, I'm going to preach it all the way from the beginning to the end, okay? So we're going to look at the story of salvation from beginning to end. If you would stand with me as we look at John chapter 1, verses 1 through 5, and then verses 11 through 14, which again is John's presentation of the Christmas story, because Christmas is about God stepping out of heaven to come to this earth, the incarnation of God into Jesus, that little baby born there in Bethlehem in a stable placed in a manger. Look with me at the Word of God here, beginning in verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in the darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. And then skip down to verse 11. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word was made flesh. And dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your holy word. And we thank you for an explanation of Christmas. How that the word became flesh and dwelt among us. We are thankful for that very special moment in time. When the Word, the Lord Jesus, became flesh, born into this world to pay for our sins. How thankful we are for a Savior, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Father, I pray today that if there's someone here that does not know you as their personal Lord and Savior, if there's someone here who's never received you into their heart, Father, I pray that today would be that day. I pray for believers that have gathered here to worship you. May you be worshipped by the reading and the preaching of your word and by our commitment to serve you more fully. And Father, I pray that if there's someone here that you're calling to be some part of our church family to serve you here, Father, I pray that they would respond to that call. Father, maybe there's something else that you desire to say to someone here today through the still small voice of the Holy Spirit, may we be open to hear from you through both the reading and the proclamation of your word. And we pray this in the wonderful and powerful name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. You may be seated. Well, there are a variety of Christian traditions that abound in America. One tradition may be in your home that that you bake cookies with the children. Uh, Maybe that was true for you when you had kids. Maybe that's true in your home with your children, that that you have a cookie-baking celebration. I know this Wednesday night, our children are going to bake cookies. I I, I don't always hear things right, but I think Beth said that they're baking about 200 cookies. So you make sure and come Wednesday night. Uh, did I say Tuesday, Wednesday night, they're, they're baking the cookies, and then we're going to have the fellowship with cake and ice cream and cookies, 200 cookies. That's a lot of cookies that the children are, are baking, and they're going to have a great time on Wednesday night. But maybe that's part of your personal 
family tradition is baking cookies in the home for Christmas. You know, Donna and I had our own special kind of a holiday celebration, a, a, a Christmas tradition in our family. Is Christmas Eve, we always eat barbecue. Now that it's just me and Donna, we tend to go out for barbecue uh, rather than have it uh, and like we did when all the kids were home. And, and we always baked a, a, a Christmas a, a birthday cake for Jesus. Anybody ever bake a birthday cake for Jesus and sing happy birthday to Jesus? We did that with our kids. And uh, now it's down to a cupcake because uh, at, uh, I'm not speaking for Donna, but at my age, uh, you eat that cake, it stays with you. You know what I'm saying? So, uh, uh, but but we, we still try to have birthday cake for Jesus, even though it's just a cupcake with just me and Donna in the home. But we have our own kind of Christian Christmas tradition. And, and many of you have a Christmas tradition that involves the Christmas tree. Uh, maybe you have a tradition about how it's set up and how it's done. Uh, our tradition is, is I help Donna get it into the house, and then I get out of her way. Oh, um, that, that, that's, the, that's the tradition. And she does a great job every year of, uh, of putting up the Christmas tree. Uh, but, but I know your tradition may be very different. It could be that, uh, th that you go out and you stop at one of these places along the roadside, and you get one of those live Christmas tree and stick it on top of your vehicle. You know, I don't see that quite as much as we used to see that, but I, I, I still see people going down the road with a Christmas tree on top of their car. It, it, there was a time when it could have been the Christmas tradition was Dad would take an axe and take the children and go out into the forest and find the right tree and then chop it down. And, and maybe, maybe you still do that. I don't know. Maybe somebody here goes and you fi literally find your own Christmas tree and chop it down. I understand there are places where, uh, where you can still do that. I had a friend of mine, honest to goodness, every year, I thought it was an accident the first time I went over to his house. <laughs> I didn't want to say anything. I thought, man, that's the ugliest tree I've ever seen. <laughs> and, uh, uh, but, but, but his tradition was to find the tree that had the, the fewest uh, green on it. Uh, it always looked like a dead tree to me. It looked kind of like Charlie Brown's tree. Y'all know what I'm talking about? But he said, I like to get a tree without it, all those uh, uh, green prickly things because that way I can see my ornaments. I said, yeah, I can see all your ornaments all right. <laughs> you got a dead tree and ornaments. No, I never said that. I just thought that. But, uh, but, but that was his tradition. He went out and got the tree that I think looked the deadest in the whole lot and brought it home because that way he could see his ornament. Uh, you may be uh, uh, like one of those people that had the biggest tree you can find, like what you'd find in the White House. That's what my sister does. She gets a giant tree, and then she gets it home, and they cut off the top of the tree so it will fit in the house. And the first time I saw that, uh, when I got home from, uh, from college and spent my first Christmas at, at home with, uh, and, and saw that, it looked like the Christmas tree went up into the ceiling. I thought, where's the rest of it, you know? I didn't say anything, but, but that's their tradition. They find a giant tree and then get it home and cut the top off. I see a couple of heads doing like that. Maybe you do the same thing. I don't know. You, you, you get a giant tree like that. But where did we get this tradition that involves trees and putting up a Christmas tree. Well, I want to share that story as I get into what the Bible says about some trees in the Word of God. It began with a, a pastor that was, was really kind of unique. He came from Wittenberg, Germany, and his name was Martin Luther. It, you see, it was a Halloween night that he went out and nailed 95 statements on the wall or, or on the door of the church. We call that 95 theses, but they were just 95 statements that he nailed on the front door of the church that, that talked about the fact that salvation did not come from paying money to the church. Friend, you can't buy your salvation with money. And what he said was that salvation was already bought by Jesus Christ when he hung on a rough, rugged cross for our sins. 
And so he writes 95 statements and he nailed them to the door of his church on, on a Halloween night. All Hallows Eve. Well, this same guy, Martin Luther, uh, he, he for years uh, told his people not to bring evergreens into their homes at Christmas because a, a, an old dead evergreen that they cut down uh, symbolized death. It was a symbol of an old pagan tradition of bringing evergreen into the home in hopes that they would appease false gods and that winter would go away and that the sun would come back and summertime would come back. But he was fighting a losing battle because his people were still bringing trees into the home to celebrate Christmas. And one night he was preparing his Christmas Eve service and he was praying to God, give me an answer for my people that keep bringing these trees into the, their house. And he was singing a Christmas carol and looking through the trees and he noticed the stars twinkling behind the trees. And he thought about the passage of Scripture we read today, how that Jesus is the light, and, and, and the light shineth in the world, and the world didn't comprehend. So he said, you know, if we take the green tree and we put lights on it to symbolize Jesus, why the light will, uh, will, will show that we don't believe in that old pagan tradition, but the light of Jesus has come to overcome that old dead religion. And so he went home, he got himself a tree, and he started putting candles on it. In fact, uh, and I don't recommend this, but, uh, but, but he was stringing candles up on the tree to symbolize that Jesus is the light that came into the world. And now we've got a fire marshal here. And the reason I don't suggest doing this is because tradition says that it was Martin Luther that also had the first Christmas tree fire. <laughs> so, uh, so, so make sure that you, your lights are UL approved and, and, uh, and, that, and that you do it safely when you put light on the tree. Let me tell you something. The story of Christmas and the message of salvation involved the tree of life. When you look at your Christmas tree this year and next year and every year that follows, I want you to remember the story I just shared with you and remember that it's the light that represents that Jesus came into a dark world, which he did, and, and that in spite of, uh, of paganism and false gods, that the light overcomes the darkness that Jesus is the light of the world. And so John describes not only uh, the, uh, the light, but he also describes the tree of life, which is a picture of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now I want to make it clear that Jesus said that he is the, the water of life. Amen? That's one of the I am statements in the book of John. And Jesus said, I am the light. But Jesus never actually said, I am the tree of life. And, and so I believe everything in the word of God. And I believe one day we're going to see a tree of life, just as the Bible describes it. But the tree of life is at the very least a picture of Jesus because the Bible is very clear and says that in him is life. There is no life apart from Jesus. Amen? And so throughout the Bible, there are trees that mark the beginning, the climax, and the end of the salvation story that we're going to look at today. First of all, we've got to go back and look at the tree of sin. When I thought about today's sermon, I thought about the series of sermons that we have been given by the Lord throughout this year. And when we started 2018, we began with the creation story. And so today I want to go back and review. Because beginning in verse 8, listen to what the Bible says in Genesis chapter 2. And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden. And there he put a man whom he formed out of the ground, made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. 
the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Listen closely to me. God's love for human beings began in the Garden of Eden. If you're here today, listen closely. God loves you. I don't know what kind of trial you're going through. I don't know what kind of trouble or tribulation you may be facing. But God loves you. Listen, it's the devil that came to bring sin and death and disease and destruction into the world, but Jesus came to bring life and light into the world. Let's go back and remember what we talked about as we went through the book of Genesis. Uh, on day number six of creation, on that day, God scooped down his hands into the dirt. A and out of the dust of the ground, he formed Adam. Oh, listen, after he created that, that body, he knelt down, and the Bible says he breathed the breath of life into Adam, and Adam's lungs were filled with life that only comes from God. Know this, life is a gift from God. Amen. Listen, I believe in the sanctity of human life. I believe that life is a gift from God, and but, but after creating Adam, it's the first time in the creation story that God didn't say it was good. In fact, he said it is not good that man should be alone. And he said, I'll create a helpmeet for him. And so on day six, he put Adam to sleep and he took the rib out of Adam. And, and from the rib, he made Eve and brought the man and the woman together. And there in the Garden of Eden, we see the first marriage ceremony between a man and a woman. But then God took these two perfect human beings in a perfect environment called the Garden of Eden, and he put one simple requirement, one simple requirement on the young couple in Genesis 2, 16 and 17, he said, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And he said, when you do, there will be consequences. He said, when you eat of it, you will surely die. Oh, listen. He said, if you eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, Death will come into the world. You will surely die. Everything will be ruined. Reminds me of when I was a kid. I don't know if they did this in your house, but maybe I was just a special kid. Had to be reminded. But my presence always said, do not open until Christmas Day. Anybody ever see that on a tag? Do not open until Christmas Day. And, and my, my, my parents would say, you know, if you open the present, you'll ruin everything. So don't open them. And I remember one Christmas, I ruined everything. <laughs> I just couldn't stand it. I thought, I'll just take a peek. And sure enough, it wasn't the same. Uh, uh, let, let me tell you, God said, when you eat of the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you'll ruin everything. Adam and Eve ate of that tree, and when they did, sin and death entered into the world. And because sin came into the world, it was passed upon every one of us. And I know you took time out of your day to come worship the Lord. You didn't come to church to, for somebody to, to insult you in any way, but I got something I got to tell you. <laughs> You're a sinner. I'll tell you something else. I'm a sinner. You see, we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. And, and it all began there in the Garden of Eden because Adam and Eve took of that tree, the fruit of that tree, of the knowledge of good and evil. Sin entered into the world. Paul the Apostle explains it like this in Romans chapter 5. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, 
and death through sin. And in this way, death came to all men because all have sinned. Listen, when Adam and Eve sinned, they not only brought death to themselves, they brought death and destruction to all mankind. But even as God was passing out their judgment, He gave them a cause for hope. Because in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, He said this to the serpent. He said, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. And that's exactly what happened. Listen, on that Christmas, when Jesus stepped out of heaven and was born there in Bethlehem, the promised Savior came. God gave that promise, and that promised Savior was born on that Christmas day. John gives us the Christmas story like this. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then verse 14 says, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Well, that's the first tree. The second tree we have to look at is the tree of sacrifice. Because 1 Peter tells us about that tree. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24, Jesus bore our sin in His body on the tree in order that being dead to sin, we might live to righteousness. Jesus came into a dirty, stinking, sinful world. And that's pictured by how that first Christmas came about. I hope you'll be with us on Wednesday as we experience the Christmas experience together this Wednesday night. Because you'll see a dramatic presentation of of how that stable is a picture of this nasty, dirty world. You know, we have Christmas cards, and they look so sweet <laughs> with that stable scene. But can I tell you something? Stables stink, amen? <laughs> Anybody ever been to a real stable with animals? And, and the hay's not clean. It's nasty, amen? And, uh, and, and that's just a picture of the dark sinful world that God left heaven and came to this earth. I'm so thankful. That in spite of my sin, the sin of my family, there was a child that was lost, a family that had turned its back on the church, that God didn't give up on me. And when I needed him and called out for the Lord to save me, he loved me. He came into my heart and changed my life. Listen, we have a Savior who knows our temptations. He, he knows what we go through. He knows the troubles we experience. Listen to Hebrews 4.15. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. But we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, but listen to this, but without sin. I'm thankful that Jesus lived a perfect life. He was our perfect sacrifice. Jesus understands your struggles, and Jesus understands even our sinful nature, but yet He loves us. Again, I want to tell you, if you're here today, God loves you. You're no accident. You're here for a purpose. And today I want you to hear that on a tree of sacrifice, Jesus gave his life. Listen to what God's word says. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. He came into his own, and his own received him not. And so the people placed him on a tree. And the Bible records that in Luke chapter 23, verse 33. And when they were come to the place which is called Calvary, there they crucified him. The cross is the tree of suffering and sacrifice. And 1 Peter again explains that to this. He says this in 1 Peter 2.24, Jesus bore our sins 
in his body on the tree in order that being dead to sin, we may live to righteousness. But then 1 Peter goes on to say this, For Christ also hath once suffered the just for the unjust that he might bring us to God. But there's one more tree that I want us to see before we leave today. And that's the tree of salvation. Because there's another tree that the Bible tells us about. It's found in Revelation chapter 22, verses 1 through 5. And again, it is a picture of the Lord Jesus. Listen to what it says. And he showed me a pure river of water of life. Now again, Jesus made it clear that he is the water of life. Look at what it says, clear and crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb, and in the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river, was there the tree of life. Listen, Jesus gives the tree of life to those who receive him. He is the life. And without him, there is no life. Oh, when Adam and Eve sinned, they were banished from the garden. Never again were they to see the tree of life on this earth. Listen, all who have trusted Jesus as their Savior have access to the tree of life forever, according to the Word of God. You say, Pastor, can you explain all that? No. I can't explain it all, but I believe it all because it's in this word. Amen? Listen, this word says that the day is going to come that when we see heaven, that there is a tree of life and that we will always have access to it. Listen, the message of Christmas is that Jesus came into the world so that we could be forgiven from sin and receive God's gift of eternal life. Jesus alone gives this life, for he is the life. Listen again to our text. But as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become the children of God, even to them that believe on his name. Can you honestly say that you're a child of God? Do you know for certain that there's been that moment in time when you received Christ as your Savior? Listen, this Christmas season, we're able to have life instead of death. The angel said, fear not. We don't need to worry about death or destruction or disease. Listen, those things may come in this life, but this life is but a drop compared to the ocean that is eternity. I'm so thankful that Jesus is the life. And when you look at your Christmas tree this year, I want you to remember that he's the light and the life who came into the world for you and me. So would you accept Christ today? If you've not received Christ, would you do that today? Would you allow him to come into your heart and be the Lord, the boss and savior of your life today? You might say, Pastor, how do I do that? Well, the first thing you must do is you must realize that you're a sinner. You see, we've all thought things that are wrong. We've said things that are wrong. We've done things that are wrong. And then there were the things that we were supposed to do that we didn't do. And to him that knoweth to do right and not to do it, that's a sin. We are sinful both by our nature and our choices. The Bible says we must first recognize our need for forgiveness and realize that we're a sinner. Second of all, we need to recognize that Jesus is the life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. But then third, Jesus said that We must repent of our sin. Repentance isn't an act or sacrament we do in order to be saved. It is part of faith. You see, if we believe in Jesus, we will trust him 
and turn away from living for sin and turn to live for the Savior. That's what repentance means. The Greek word is metaneo. And it means to have a change of mind about sin. Listen, it doesn't mean you'll never sin again. But it does mean you have the power when you repent from sin and receive the Savior to live a victorious life. Listen, are you willing to turn away from sin and selfishness and turn to the Lord? Will you agree with your mind that sin is wrong? And will you agree that you need to live for the Lord? Would you give him your heart and life and repent from sin? And then finally, the Bible says we must receive. But as many as received him, to them gave he the authority to be called the children of God. Have you received him into your heart? You know, you can ask him into your heart. You can ask Jesus into your life right now. In Revelation chapter 3, verse 20, it's one of the greatest verses in the Bible. Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man will hear my voice, that means any man or woman, teenager, boy or girl, if you'll hear the voice of God, listen, he says, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone will hear my voice and open the door, I'll come in. Have you received him? Have you asked him into your heart? If not, you can pray a prayer like this. Look at the prayer that's on the screen behind me. Have you prayed a prayer like this? Dear Lord Jesus, I know that I am a sinner and need your forgiveness. I believe that you died for my sins. I want to turn from my sins. I invite you to come into my heart and life. I want to trust and follow you as the Lord, that means ruler and boss, and my Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. Listen, you can say a prayer you don't mean. It won't change your life. But with all your heart, if you mean it, today you can turn from sin and ask Jesus to be the boss of your life. You can ask him to come in and forgive you of your sin. And, and you can commit your life to him. He'll change your life. He'll give you eternal life and a home in heaven. Would you receive him? It could be that you've asked Christ into your heart at some other point in time, but you've never publicly taken your stand for him. Would you come and take your stand for Christ? It could be that you need to be baptized as an outward indication of the inward change. It could be that God is calling you to be a part of this church. What is God speaking to your heart and saying today? You can ask.